A really important idea in understanding curved coordinates and their application to physics is the idea of infinitesimal displacement vectors. So let's consider a point at some vector r in the xy plane. Let's just consider 2D coordinates for now. So in Cartesian coordinates, that point is at x, y. Let's consider a very nearby point, differentially nearby. So it's some distance dr away. Well, so now it's at some new point. And we call that r plus dr. And certainly that is at x plus dx, comma, y plus dy. Or said another way, the displacement vector between these two points, dr vector, is dy, comma, dx. OK, so what we really want to talk about is the infinitesimal, infinitesimal displacement uh, or the infinitesimal distance between these two points. Um, here, it's pretty obvious what that distance is. Well, in vector form, we write that dl vector is dx, x hat plus dy, y hat, or said another way, the distance in the x direction is just dx, the distance in the y direction is dy. That all makes sense in Cartesian coordinates, but let's see how it works in, uh, in polar coordinates to see how curved coordinates complicate things. So let's consider a point um, at some fixed distance from the origin, and that point is at the coordinates s comma phi. Now let's consider a new point, still at the same distance, but uh, displaced in the angular direction. So there's a displacement vector, dr, and so the new point is at r plus dr, so it's at s and phi plus d phi. So we might be tempted to write dr vector is equal to 0 comma d phi. Um, but the question we're really interested in is, what is the distance between these two points? And certainly, the distance cannot be d phi. And the reason is, d phi doesn't have the right units. Uh, d phi is just units of, well, radians. Um, so it doesn't have any units of distance. And so that can't be what we mean by distance between these two points. So we need to be a little bit more careful. So what we really mean is dl vector, the distance between these two points, is a d phi times phi hat. Well, a d phi is, of course, just the arc length, and that's where we got that from. Um, so we have to use this as what we mean by displacement or distance. You can consider more generally in polar coordinates. You don't have to just move along a fixed distance from the origin. You can move anywhere uh, in the xy plane. And so consider a point here, and then another point displaced there. So certainly these are at different distances from the origin. And so this new point is at r plus dr. And so it has moved some distance d phi. And it has also moved a little bit of distance from the origin. We call that ds. OK. So we can ask the same question. Uh, what happens for the displacement vector between these two points uh, for a general displacement in both the s and in the phi directions? So the displacement dl vector, well, in the s direction, it's just ds, s hat. In the phi hat direction, it's just s d phi, which is what we found before. Um, so you can write this as components. dl s, the displacement or the length in the s direction, is just ds, kind of what you would expect. And the displacement or length in the phi direction is s d phi. And so notice again that you have this extra factor of s. It's not just t phi. It doesn't have the right units. OK, so let's apply this to an example uh, so we can see why you would care about such a thing. So let's consider uh, the area of this small shaded box here, infinitesimally small shaded box. So what is the area of this small shaded box? Let's call that area dA. Well, if the box has height dy and length dx, the area of the box is, of course, dx times dy. OK. I'm going to write that another way. I'm going to write that area of the box as dl sub x, dl sub y, a little bit of length in the x direction and a little bit of length in the y direction. And so these are just the components of the infinitesimal displacement vector that we saw before. It seems trivial in this case because it's Cartesian coordinates. Everything makes sense. Uh, but let's see what happens if we consider a curved coordinate system, namely polar coordinates. So now we have a box which is slightly curved, and this box has displacement in both the s direction and in the phi direction. 
So what is the area of the shaded box in this case? Well, the area is still just the, it looks like a rectangle, so it's just the length times the height, and so it's dl sub s, dl sub phi, the length in the s direction, length in the phi direction. So we come up with an expression like this for the small amount of area. Let's apply this to a case uh, where we can use this to see why we would care. Um, so I have some semicircular region. It's actually a, a wedge cut out of a circle. And the wedge has a radius a, and as it ends at some angle, phi is equal to 3 pi over 5. So we could ask, what is the area of this particular wedge, this particular region shown here? Well, there's various ways of trying to do this. You could try and um, take the fraction of this region compared to the total area of a circle. But let's do it using our displacement vectors. So the area of a small amount of box is, as we found before, ds times s d phi. So the total area must just be the integral over dA. And that turns out to be a double integral, because we have two directions. So we have integral s ds d phi, where s goes from 0 to a, and phi goes from 0 to 3 pi over 5. So we can write this then as two separate integrals, integral over phi, and then the integral over the s. And these are relatively good integrals to do, easy integrals to do. And so we get a final result that the area of this shaded region is 3 pi a squared over 10. Not particularly intuitive. Um, and so this approach really helps us understand how to construct these types of areas. How does this work in 3D? Well, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so you have some position vector and some displacement dl vector to a new point. And so we want to know what the components are in different coordinates. So in Cartesian coordinates, it's of course just dx, x hat, dy, y hat, dz, z hat. So the lengths are exactly what you would think, because again, it's Cartesian coordinates. Things make sense. Okay, how about in cylindrical coordinates? So recall, cylindrical coordinates are just polar coordinates with a z direction tacked on. So you would expect that the displacement vector should look like polar coordinates with an extra z direction just like Cartesian coordinates. And that's indeed what we find. dl vector is ds s hat plus s d phi phi hat plus dz in the z direction. So the displacement in the s direction, the phi direction are as before. And again, in the displacement in the z direction is just dz. OK, how about spherical coordinates? So in spherical coordinates, we describe the point by one position, uh, the radius, and then two angles. So dl vector is dr in the r direction r d theta in the theta direction, and r sine of theta d phi in the phi direction. We can write this out in components, which is often more useful to do. Um, again, saying the same thing, the displacement in each of the radial and then the two angular directions. So this is the idea of displacement vector for 3D curved coordinate systems.